Welcome to PTI. We will get to the NBA Conference Finals and the Rafael Nadal loss at the French Open in a moment, but we begin today with the passing of the legendary Bill Walton. The Hall of Famer died today of cancer at the age of 71. Walton won two college titles at UCLA and NBA titles with the Trailblazers and Celtics, but so many people today will remember him as one of the most entertaining broadcasters in basketball. Through every phase, he regularly challenged conventional culture. Wilbon, what are your reflections on the player, the broadcaster, and the man? Well, Tony, um, I don't even know where to start. My whole life, I've been aware of Bill Walton, and then luckily enough, over the past 20 years at times, to work with Bill Walton. And I, you know, you mentioned some of the amazing things about his basketball career. The first thing is, and I'm talking to my 16-year-old son about him, and I'm saying, look, you need to look at the high, look at the film, find it, find it on YouTube, go where you need to. Don't let the numbers try to explain to you who Bill Walton was. He was a great athlete. He was as skilled a, a player, a big man, as there has been. I mean, you look at, I just looked at clips of Bill Walton shooting left-handed bank shots, bank hooks over his shoulder in championship games, whether for Portland or for the Celtics, and you mentioned both teams. Great player at UCLA. And then, Tony, he has all these injuries just sort of rearrange his career and lessen it to such a yeah. degree. But he goes into yep. a booth, and as you know, with Steve Snapper Jones and then with Dave Pash, and a lot of people maybe didn't like Bill in the moment. You and I loved him. We would talk about the things he would say and phrases he coined. And I worked with Bill in Bristol. He would fly to Bristol. He started his television career, part of it, at ESPN. And he was in such pain, his feet and back, he would have to lay on the floor during the commercial break sometimes or between shows because he was in such pain, but yet he was the guy in the room after being a severe stutterer and being so withdrawn as a young person to be as outgoing as he, as he was. And so it's just, I'm, I'm incredibly sad today because Bill Walton has been in all the parts of basketball, watching it, the game, consuming it, the broadcast that I've ever experienced. And I, I yeah. love them, and I know you did too. Well, un unlike you, I covered him in college. Um, I was in St. Louis in 1973 when he shot 21 for 22 against Memphis State and won the national championship. I think he had like 44 points and 13 rebounds. The next year, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, when David Thompson beat Bill Walton in UCLA in the semifinals, and they went on to win the national championship. I covered him when he was in the NBA early in Portland. I was in Philadelphia when Portland beat the 76ers for the NBA title. And I was in the room when our friend Brent Musburger held up a microphone in front of Bill Walton and began his question with the following words, big guy, big guy, big guy, <laughs> big guy, big guy. Okay, now Walton was very difficult to deal with in UCLA and in his early years in the NBA for the press. Okay, John Wooden sheltered him. John Wooden didn't yeah. force him to talk to anybody, and Bill didn't want to talk. He was rather mysterious. So as you can imagine, for me, Mike, at my age, it was with amazement that I looked at Bill Walton as a broadcaster and how, yeah. how outgoing he was and how bombastic he was, how talkative he was, how funny he was, and in later years... I would stand with him and say, well, what happened when you were a kid and I was a kid and you never talked, never talked to anybody? And in terms of playing, if you didn't see him when he was healthy, you won't understand what I'm saying. He was a great and dominant player, so much so that a, that a basketball league, the ABA, offered to put a franchise in his hometown and stock it with UCLA players if he would sign with them in the early 70s. And, and that didn't have. I'll just say this. The two greatest college players ever are Bill Walton and Kareem. Ever. That's it. That's the list. We have reached real, the point. Let me, let me, let both, me mention this to you real quickly, Tony. When I was inducted, fortunately for me, gratefully, into the Basketball Hall of Fame a couple of years ago, I'm rehearsing my speech. And Bill Walton ducks his head in the room. And you're supposed to have five minutes for the speech. And he says... You go longer than five minutes, I'm giving you my blessing. There's no bell. Tony's not here. He can't stop you. <laughs> you go until they drag you off the stage. And, I, of course, I laughed until I was almost in tears 
that Bill Walton, who ducked his head into everybody's life, everybody's got a story, a great one, about Bill Walton. It's the way it should be. Yeah. We'll move on. We've reached the point where both NBA conference finals stand at 3 nothing after Dallas beat Minnesota in Minnesota last night. Boston and Dallas appear to be in complete command. Their younger opponents, Indiana and Minnesota, don't seem ready for prime time. Wilbon, what's the word for what we are seeing? Finals. <laughs> We're seeing the two teams at 3-0 go to the finals, Tony, and they're going to have... I I'm starting to think this could really be a great, great, great matchup. Most of the year, everybody would have taken Boston in this matchup. And Dallas was coming along slowly, right? But even the other day, you know, when Malika Andrews and I got to talk to Kyrie Irving after a game, he said that they got to the All-Star break, and he thought, this is not sustainable. We just can't be great offensively. We've got to commit ourselves to defense. And he meant we, he meant he and Luca and other, the others would follow, and they have. And so I think Dallas has now, in a span of a couple of months, gone from a good team that was interesting to potential greatness. And Boston, okay. I don't know to trust them yet, but they're going to the finals. They're not going to lose to Indy now. They could be yep. down 2-1 in this series, Tony. They really could be because they've been outplayed yep. twice, which is sort of inexcusable given who they've got. But I'm really intrigued by these two teams going at each other. And, and what the, I hope Porzingis can be out there healthy, but I want to see Boston and Dallas. I want to see it right now. Yeah, so I have a different word. In fact, I have a collection of words, and my words are the shallow end of the pool. That's the part of the pool where there's not enough water to swim in, but you can stand in it. Many of the games in this series have been interesting. Some have been actually exciting. But this series is over. Both series. Right. There's no drama right. left. They're yep. not coming back from 3-0. No NBA team has ever come back from 3-0, and 154 have tried. And Boston is a better team than Indiana and a they significantly are. better team if Halliburton yep. doesn't play. And Dallas is a better team than Minnesota and a significantly better team if this is the version of Anthony Edwards that we get and the version of Carl Anthony Towns that we get. So, so to me, um, you know, if these end, Mike, if these end at 4-0, there's nine days until the final start on June 6. All the momentum is gone. It's totally deflating. But like you, I want to see Doncic against Boston. I don't know that I want to see the other way, but I want to see Doncic against Boston. Because I believe, Mike, that if there's any two players in the NBA who are teammates who are as watchable and as great as Doncic and Irving, it, it's going to be Tatum and Jalen Brown. I, mean, yes. I, I want Agreed. to see that. Don't want to we see agree. the rest of this. Want to see that. No. So we'll move to Let's tennis. Get past this. Yeah. The great Rafael Nadal lost in straight sets today in the first round of the French Open, 6-3, 7-6, 6-3, to number four seed Alexander Zverev. That's a really tough draw. Afterwards, the nearly 38-year-old Nadal, who has won this tournament 14... It's okay. Nadal is... Look, the, the GOAT conversation of tennis, we know what it is. I know you don't even want to include Joker's name in it, Djokovic, but he's in it. And, of course, Federer. And I don't even know... Maybe yeah. it's just those three, because I don't even know that you can go back in time to Agassi and Sampras and Macaro and Borg and Connors. I don't know, Connors. I don't know that you can do that, because these guys have dominated for so long, for 15 years. They've been at the top of it. But... It's okay. It's all right. I mean, the doc, you can't go on forever. And he went on for right. close to forever. Zverev is a hell of a player. I don't know. Yeah. Tony, this is sort of like when Tiger and Phil, you know, sort of passed from the scene and they're no longer the dominant players. But golf seemed to inherit a cast of characters, an ensemble where there's greatness. There's some great players. I don't know that tennis is like that for sure, but it reminds me of that. That's interesting. I mean, look, Nadal is an all-time great. Federer was an all-time all great. Djokovic is an all-time great. Federer's out. It appears that Nadal is done here. And Djokovic is now losing to people who couldn't get a set off him two years ago, right? right. So maybe it's Alcaraz, but there's no gravity yet with Alcaraz. The last time Nadal actually played in Paris, he won. I think 2022. And then his body, which had been breaking down for years, actually began to crumble. And he couldn't get there last year. He had, I think it was a hip injury. He hasn't played much this year. I believe he's never gotten past the quarterfinal this year. I think he lost in the second round in the Italian on clay the other day. So you know why he wants, wants to get to Roland Garros? Because nobody's ever dominated like he has. Do you know his record, Mike, counting this loss at the French Open? 
It's 112 and four. That's his <laughs> record. Insane. Nobody's ever going to do that That's anywhere. Kareem Nobody and Walton ever. like. That's what that's, that's like. To, Kareem yes. and Walton. Yes. Stop. 112 and four. Get out of here. Let's take a break. Coming up, where does the Rangers' overtime win put them? Where does it leave the Panthers? And Yosef Newgarden goes back to back at the Indy 500. How big a deal is that? Well, this one That's a great Walton event. story at the Hall of Fame. That's a great story. He Tuck should have head. said to you, throw it down, big man. Throw it down, throw young it down. man. Throw it down. Just talk yeah. past the bell. Tony's not here. He can't stop you. <laughs> Never talked in college. Drove me crazy. You Time to find out what's big with the Littles. I'll get the first one. Mail time! Go to the glasses. Where does Ronald Acuna Jr.'s second ACL tear leave Ugh. him and the Braves? Ugh. Ugh. Well, this has happened before, Tony. You mentioned second, and the Braves were able to sort of soldier on and win that year, and they didn't win when he was the MVP. But Acuna, listen to this. He's led the league already at 26 years old, twice in plate appearances, once in at-bats, twice in runs, three times in stolen bases. I mean, he's led in, in on-base percentage. He's led in OPS. He, he's led in total bases. He's led in a lot of things, and he's been an MVP. And it leaves any team yeah. that he leaves reduced. It just does. Because you we, we can talk about what has happened, but we don't know what's going to happen. You just hope he can come back. He's done it once. I know it's going to be hard, but he's such a great and exciting young athlete I just saw him in person a couple of weeks ago out here in L.A. The game is lesser, lesser without him for the rest of this season. So two ACLs strikes me as, as really rough. We have become accustomed to seeing people come back from one ACL yeah. rather routinely. But two, it, you know, it makes you think of two Tommy Johns. You know, you go, you're thinking, well, that's one too many. And this is a great player. We've come to think of the 40-40 as an incredible achievement. 40 home runs and 40 stolen bases. He went 40-70 last year. Nobody has ever done that. Um, he loses a full year, and he loses a year in his prime. So everyone is deprived who watches yeah. baseball of seeing him. Now, as you mentioned, the last time he had a torn ACL, the Braves won the World Series. Because baseball is not basketball. It's not. If your best player goes out in baseball, there's a lot of other players who can pitch in and make up for it. It's not like basketball. But they are at the point now, Mike, they lose their best player in Acuna. They lost their best pitcher in Strider just a little while ago. I mean, that hurts a, lot a team. Overcome. I mean, if, if, you're, yeah. if you're the Philadelphia Phillies and you're already six up on Atlanta, you're thinking, Feeling we've got good. a clear path to winning the division. That's yeah. what you're thinking. If you're Just hope right? Acuna can come no, back. This. He's what Theo Epstein yeah. has in mind when they want to see more action in baseball. Ronald Acuna right. Jr. is that. Yeah, get a hit, steal two bases. Yeah. What does the Rangers' overtime win in Game 3 do for them, and where does it leave the Panthers? Well, Tony, when you can sort of reclaim home ice and you can reclaim the lead in a series... And it looked like the Rangers were, I don't want to say teetering, but they were certainly on their heels. I thought the Panthers had them in that place. And the Panthers are, I don't care about record and points this year. The, the Panthers are their equal. And when you got Shesterkin and goal for New York, you got to feel pretty good about where you are, even with a lot of series still remaining. This is an enormous win for the Rangers because they were outshot in this game 38 to 23. And 13 to 4 in the third period when the Panthers came back from 4 2 to 4 4. This is, look, the Rangers are on the road against the team that was in the Stanley Cup final last year. The Panthers are supposed to win this game. And then this shot, and I was watching live. I don't know how I got on it, but I was watching the last five minutes of regulation and then the overtime. The uh, shot out of nowhere. I don't know if it hit the guy's hands. I don't know if it hit his stick. I don't know if it hit his chest. I don't know what happened. Deflection, but home. there is Deflection. this goal. There is this goal, and, and it's an overtime win. Again, an overtime win. Mike, the Rangers are 5-0 and oh in overtime games in these playoffs. They ought to make sure that every game goes to overtime because they're perfect in that. They're not, they're not supposed to win this one. Totally outshot and outplayed when it seemed like it counted, and they win the game. And as you say, back to home ice. 
you know, back nice. against yep. a really good team. Against a really good team. All right, let's get out of here. Enough email. Let's take one last break. Still to come, Connor McDavid and the Oilers try to bounce back from their game two loss tonight. And Angel Reese goes down, goes down hard, but gets back up and plays. Chicago Sky. The famous okay person in my Reese. ear tells me they're four and zero in overtime games. So I'm thinking ahead as a Ranger fan you got to when they game get coming. to be five and zero. That's yeah. Fine. I wouldn't worry about it. Tonight on. Happy time, people. Happy 27th birthday, Daniel Jones. This feels like the year of reckoning for Jones and the New York Giants. Jones is coming off a torn ACL and was 1-5 in five as a starter last year. He signed a four-year contract last year, but the deal is structured with an escape hatch for the team after this coming season. Jones is now without Saquon Barkley, who left in free agency, but Jones is excited about first-round draft pick LSU's Malik Neighbors. Jones is 22-37-1 as a starter with the Giants. In his 85.2 career passing rating, ranked 47th out of 95 quarterbacks who have thrown at least 100 passes since Jones entered the league in 2019. Tony, he'll be around. Jones has some physical skills and talent, some athleticism. He'll be around if he wants to for at least 10 more seasons as a quarterback in the NFL. So, yes, it may be a day of reckoning or a season of reckoning with the G-men, but not in terms of his whole career. Guys like Flacco and Testaverde, they can stay around forever, lead you to the playoffs. Daniel Jones will play somewhere. He'll find another home if the Giants don't want him. Yeah, he's had very good games, a couple in a yes. row, but he hasn't had like five in a row or six. I haven't had that. Happy anniversary, Boston Celtics. Around this day 37 years ago, with Boston having just turned the ball over and trailing the Pistons by one point with five seconds left, Larry Bird stole the inbounds pass from Isaiah Thomas and found a cutting Dennis Johnson for the winning basket. Perhaps you remember Johnny Most with the call. A Here's a steal by Bird underneath the DJ, and he lays it in. <laughs> Coincidentally, the date of that steal is the exact same as John Havlicek's famous steal Havlicek against the Lakers the ball. 22 years before. Havlicek Havlicek the ball. Ball. It's also just one day after last Saturday's where Drew Holiday stole the ball from Andrew Nebhard, icing Boston's win over Indiana. I was always jealous that you were in Madison Square Garden courtside for the Reggie Miller game. Yeah, that, that, that's yes. the game I, I wanted to yes. be at. But yes. I working for the Washington Post like we both did. I was at the bird stole the ball over to DJ, DJ lays it in. I was there. I'm looking at it right in front of me. And as it happens, you just turn to people and say, my God, I cannot believe that happened. One of the yeah. great plays in NBA history. And DJ, Dennis Johnson, one of the underrated players ever of all time. But in the Hall of Fame. In, in, in the, the Hall of Fame, the Hall of Fame yeah, yes. still underrated though. All right. All right. Happy trails, Alyssa Thomas. The Connecticut Sun star was tossed on Saturday for throwing rookie Angel Reese to the ground late in the third quarter of Connecticut's road win over Chicago. Reese, who has openly said she has idolized Thomas ever since she watched her play at the University of Maryland, took no umbrage at the hard foul, which was judged to be a flagrant two upon review. Reese said, quote, it's no hard feelings to AT. I'm a basketball player. I want them to come at me every day. They're not supposed to be nice, unquote. Thomas and Reese were jostling under the basket when Thomas slammed Reese down. Reese was making her home debut in Chicago. She had 13 points and five rebounds. Reese is going to be huge star in Chicago with that attitude. Throw me down, I'll throw you down. Let's go. That's what we're about. I can't wait to go and see the Sky play in person. They had that great win in New York. Good for them. They don't even have Cardoso yet. So Angel Reese, right. believe me, there's some... She's going to be a popular person in my hometown and her new town. They were really banging around under the boards. They were. I mean, I'm not saying you could see this coming, but they, yeah. I mean, they, they that were, looked like they were people, going at it. People are saying Good. enough is enough on this one, Love don't you that. think? All right, let's go to the big finish. Let's the Orioles it. beat the Red Sox today for their fifth straight win. Is that significant? Probably, Tony. I mean, it's a long summer, but Yanks O's, that would be pretty good. It's a flashback, throwback for guys like you and me. So even I-95, yeah. I can still root for that. Oh, a nice Joseph word Newgarden. about I-95, that's right. Nice. Yeah. Joseph Newgarden won the Indy 500, second straight year. Your thoughts, you watched it, didn't you? I did. Um, it's only happened twice now in the last 50 years. Castroneves did it 
by an 0102, I think. And now the repeats are very infrequent. And the last lap was thrilling. Thrilling. Max Verstappen finished sixth at the Monaco Grand Prix. Cause for concern? Concern? No. He wins everything. My God, but it's the first time all season he's not on the podium in a race that he actually finished. But concern, let's not get crazy. DJ Wagner transferred from Kentucky to Arkansas. Is that a big deal? He's following Calipari, who recruited him out of high school. The Wagners have had three great players. Yeah, they have. In a row, going back to Milt Wagner, yeah. who won a championship at Louisville. Last one, Stars and Oilers, game three tonight. Who you got? You know what my answer about this is. The, the action moves to Edmonton. I want to see the Oilers win. I want to see them in the Stanley Cup final. That's what I want. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. And I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. NBA Countdown is on at 7 Eastern. Let me say it one more time as a tribute to Bill Walton. Throw it down, young man. Throw it down.